Hello everyone, I'd like to begin this video with an apology, but if you'd rather just get to the video, I'll put a timestamp on screen now. Now, on January 5th, 2024, I published a video claiming to cover every standard issue rifle used by the United States since 1776, but this video was full of mistakes, all of which being pointed out by you all viewing it. Thank you for spotting these, I have no excuse for the quality of that video, and I shouldn't be making those kinds of mistakes. So, I've taken the basic concept I had and the comments you all provided to produce what you're about to watch, an actual well-researched chronology of US service rifles and muskets. The history of these weapons and just history in general means a lot to me, and I feel I'd be doing a disservice to that history if I didn't produce a factually correct timeline rather than the inaccurate one I put out previously. With that said, please enjoy the video, and thank you so very much for watching. The first weapon to be fielded by American soldiers was the British Short Land Service Musket, often referred to as the Brown Bess Musket. The Brown Bess was the most common musket on hand at the time, the Short Land having been the standard issue British musket since 1768, and the Continental Army would begin producing their own during the Revolutionary War. This weapon is a smooth bore, muzzle loading flintlock musket with an effective range of about 100 meters, though its smooth barrel makes pinpoint accuracy a tall order. It's unclear where the name Brown Bess actually comes from, but nonetheless, it was an important weapon and the first to be used by Americans in combat. Joining the Brown Bess in the Revolution was the French Model 1763 and 1766 infantry muskets, more commonly known as the Charleville musket. Introduced to the Continental Army in secret in 1776, and then openly after the French allied themselves with the American cause in 1778, this too was a smooth-bore flintlock design, firing the .69 caliber musket balls, and effective at distances of around 100 meters. The French's secret shipment of Charleville muskets to the Americans in 1776 undoubtedly prevented them from being immediately quashed by the British giving the revolutionaries more firepower to combat their oppressors. The first official service weapon of the newly formed United States, the Springfield Model 1795, was based on the earlier 1766 Charleville musket, and would be used heavily in the War of 1812. Effective at up to 275 meters, it served alongside US troops all the way until the end of the Civil War, though it was largely replaced decades before that. It was during the War of 1812, however, that several shortcomings were discovered in the weapon, such as heavy carbon buildup after firing several shots, making the weapon wildly inaccurate. But even so, it was the most common musket design fielded by the US during the war. A massive advance in firearms technology, the Harper's Ferry Model 1803 was the first rifled weapon to be adopted by the United States. The rifling of the barrel over previously used smoothbore weapons, allowing for much more accurate fire. The weapon wasn't without flaw though, taking much longer to reload, the gunpowder buildup in the barrel meaning the weapon had to be cleaned more frequently, and it wasn't compatible with a bayonet, putting those equipped with it at a disadvantage in close combat. Effective at up to 275 meters, this rifle served in the War of 1812, the Mexican-American War, and even saw some use in the Civil War though it was largely replaced in the 1810s. Due to shortcomings in the US's Springfield Model 1795 discovered in the War of 1812, the US would develop the Model 1812, though it came too late to see service in the war. Despite this, and only being in production until 1816, this flintlock musket design would remain in service until 1865, serving in the Mexican-American War and even the Civil War being effective to around 180 meters, but it was largely replaced by the Model 1816 musket. The Model 1814 and 1817 common rifles were two rifles designed to replace the musket as the standard issue firearm of the United States, but were only adopted in small numbers by the US Armed Forces, seeing some combat during the American Civil War. Originally flintlock rifles, the majority of these muzzle-loaded weapons were converted to use percussion caps by the 1860s in order to improve reliability. The most produced flintlock musket used by the American Armed Forces, the Springfield Model 1816 remained in service until the American Civil War, but saw heavy use during the westward expansion of the US in the early 19th century. 
It became a crucial part of the arsenal of Texas during their war for independence, and saw service at the Battle of the Alamo, becoming the first standard musket of the Texan army in 1839. This weapon would be updated numerous times over the coming years, spawning the models 1822, 1835, 1840, and 1842, though some government documents refer to these models as Type 1, 2, and 3 variants of the Model 1816, the majority being converted to percussion cap muskets by the time their service ended. The first breech-loading design adopted by the American Armed Forces, the Model 1819 served through the Mexican-American War, its breech-loading design allowing for faster reloading, along with the rifle having a tremendous effective range of around a thousand meters. Although it did see some use in the American Armed Forces, the whole rifle was largely overshadowed by the muskets and muzzle-loading rifles of the day, not being widely issued to soldiers and replaced fairly quickly. The first percussion cap rifle issued as standard by the US, the Model 1841 rifle gained its nickname from its famous use by the 155th Infantry Regiment in the Mexican-American War, led by Colonel and future traitor Jefferson Davis. Considered one of the most accurate rifles of the Mexican-American War, it was effective at up to 450 meters, and was originally chambered for 54 caliber balls, though the rifle would largely be rechambered in the 1850s to fire the revolutionary 58 caliber mini ball, the rifle's effectiveness making it highly favored, and helping phase out the smooth bore musket in military use. A variant of the Model 1816, the Springfield Model 1842 was the last smoothbore musket adopted by the United States. Effective at around 275 meters, this musket design was essentially the same as the previous Model 1840, save for the usage of a percussion cap over a flintlock mechanism, with models produced past 1855 having their barrels rifled to fire mini ball ammunition with new rear sights added to these rifles. This musket and its rifle variant would see extensive use throughout the Mexican-American War, along with being fielded heavily by both sides of the American Civil War. Designed to capitalize on the advantages of using the new conical mini-ball ammunition, the Springfield Model 1855 was a muzzle-loading rifled musket effective at 370 meters, but still deadly at up to 900 meters. Replacing the smoothbore Model 1842 as standard issue, it featured a Maynard tape primer system, but this would cause many rifles to misfire, and would be dropped with the US's next standard rifle, along with the accuracy of the weapon not being the greatest. Nonetheless, the Model 1855 would see widespread use in the American Civil War, both sides of the conflict having stocks of the weapon accumulated before the war. Produced nearly a million times during the Civil War, the Springfield Model 1861 was the most widely used shoulder weapon by the Union Army, firing the same mini-ball ammunition as the previous Model 1855, but ditching the often unreliable Maynard tape primer system. Favored for its reliability, range, and accuracy, the Model 1861 would be the first rifled weapon adopted as the standard infantry weapon, whereas previous rifle designs were issued exclusively to riflemen, while the average infantryman would carry a standard smoothbore musket. Despite its accuracy and range, soldiers would seldom get to exploit these advantages with the closer ranges that the majority of the Civil War's battles were fought. The Model 1861 would also be the basis upon which many breech-loading rifles would be developed, many of the Model 1861 rifles being converted to a breech-loading design in the second half of the 19th century. A minor improvement over the Model 1861, and sometimes classified as a variant of the Model 1861, the Springfield Model 1863 is a similar percussion cap rifled musket, effective at the same distances as its predecessor. It saw extensive use in the waning years of the Civil War, with hundreds of thousands of rifles made during that time. The last muzzle-loading design to be produced at the Springfield Armory, many Model 1863s, as with the Model 1861s, were converted to be breech-loading designs with the obsolescence of muzzle-loading designs following the Civil War, these conversions being cheaper than manufacturing new weapons. Produced in small numbers at the tail end of the Civil War, the Springfield Model 1865 is a modified Model 1861, reconfigured to be a breech-loading weapon, with no other changes made to the weapon's design. 
It was apparent, however, that these converted rifles wouldn't have a very long service life, and only 5,000 were ever produced, the weapon quickly becoming obsolete and being sold off by the 1870s. It was an interesting idea and very practical from a fiscal perspective, and thus while this rifled musket would be replaced, another attempt at a breech-loading conversion would be made. The second attempt at a breech-loading conversion for existing muzzle-loading rifled muskets, the Springfield Model 1866 was vastly more successful than the previous attempt, with around 52,000 Model 1863s converted to breech-loading weapons, though around half would be exported to Europe. Compared to the Model 1865, the 1866 was much less complicated in design, being much easier to make and much more reliable. And similarly to the Model 1865, the 1866 was unchanged from the rifle it was converted from, aside from the new breech-loading system. The new rifle would prove its worth in 1867, being credited for the United States victory in the Wagon Box fight, a small American force holding off a numerically superior native force due to the higher rate of fire the new breech-loading Model 1866s they were using offered. Ultimately, the Model 1866 would serve as the basis for the future breech-loading Model 1873. The Springfield Model 1868 would be an update to the Model 1866 breech-loading rifled musket, addressing a number of deficiencies in the design of its predecessor. The breech-loading mechanism is seated more securely in the receiver, and a spring-loaded extractor provided more efficient operation, along with having a sturdier barrel. Some 50,000 Model 1868s were produced, many remaining in use with the military into the 1880s. The Model 1868 would be updated with the Model 1870, but only 11,000 were ever made, and saw very limited use in the US military. The first standard issue breech-loading rifle adopted by the US Armed Forces, the Model 1873 served through the Indian Wars of the second half of the 19th century, still finding use into the Spanish-American and Philippine-American Wars near the turn of the 20th century. Chambered in the 4570 government cartridge, the new breech-loading design was effective at up to 275 meters, lasting in service as standard issue until 1892. It was incredibly powerful, so much so that soldiers remarked that the rifle could knock two men down with each shot, the man it hit, and the man that fired it. The rifle did have one key flaw, it used copper cartridges, and due to the heat created when firing the weapon, the copper could expand and make it incredibly difficult to extract the cartridge, but it was nonetheless praised for its power and accuracy. An update to the Model 1873, the Model 1884 was another breech-loading design, this one including a serrated trigger and an enhanced rear sight. It remained in service alongside the Model 1873, largely replaced by the Krag Jorgensen in 1892, but still finding use into the early years of the 20th century. The rifle would still be issued during the time of the Philippine-American War, the first shot of the war being fired by William Grayson from his Model 1884, kicking off the conflict that would cement the era of American imperialism. The last update to the Model 1873, the Model 1888 featured a new ramrod bayonet that became fairly unpopular, and the addition of a Buffington rear sight, becoming heavily used during its short time in service, with around 60,000 rifles produced. After 1892, the Model 1888 was issued to personnel not issued the new standard issue Krag Jorgensen, being the furthest evolution of the so-called trapdoor breech-loading Springfield rifles, although its design was already obsolete by the time production began. Adopted in 1892, the Krag Jorgensen bolt-action rifle, also known as just the Krag, was a Norwegian-designed weapon intended to replace the single-shot Model 1873 and its Model 1884 and 1888 updates. The rifle would see combat in the Spanish-American and Philippine-American wars, but the Krag didn't hold up very well in the tropical climates of Cuba and the Philippines, the Spanish fielding the much better Mauser 1893 rifle. Firing the 3040 Krag cartridge, and effective at up to 900 meters, this bolt-action design was produced around 500,000 times, finding use with the US Armed Forces as standard issue until it was replaced by the Springfield Model 1903. Used exclusively by the Navy and Marine Corps, the Model 1895 was the smallest caliber long gun ever issued to US military personnel at the time of its adoption. 
Chambered in 6mm Lee Navy, this straight pull bolt action rifle was effective at up to 550 meters, with only around 15,000 ever being produced. Nonetheless, the rifle saw extensive combat in the Spanish American and Philippine American wars, but its time in service was short, being replaced as early as 1899, when the Navy and Marine Corps placed orders and began to adopt the Krag Jorgensen rifle, being fully phased out by 1907. Entering service in 1903, the Model 1903 Springfield was based on captured Mauser Model 1893 rifles from Spanish troops in Cuba, and was the first American standard issue firearm chambered in 30 6 this rifle being effective at up to 275 meters. During World War I, it saw action across the Western Front as both an infantry and sniper rifle, and with the addition of a Pedersen device, could fire pistol-grade cartridges with a semi-automatic operation. It was intended to be standard issue in World War I, but production issues meant that the majority of US troops shipped off to Europe were issued the Enfield Model 1917 as their rifle. The M1 Garand would replace it in frontline service in 1936, the rifle remaining in use until the 1970s, being a proven and battle-tested bolt-action rifle design. A modified variant of the British Patton 14 Enfield rifle rechambered for the American standard 30-06 Springfield cartridge and effective at up to 700 meters. Developed due to Springfield not being able to produce enough M1903s for World War I, the Enfield Model 1917 was produced twice as fast as the M1903, with a total of 2 million built by the time production ended. The rifle remained in limited service following the war, still being issued to artillery crews during World War II, but by then it had been almost entirely replaced. Dubbed the greatest battle implement ever devised, the M1 Garand was the United States rifle of choice from 1936 until 1957, the semi-automatic classic being the weapon most commonly fielded by American riflemen during the Second World War. Chambered in 30 6 Springfield, the M1 was effective at up to 450 meters, firing out of 8-round on-block clips, ejecting the spent clip with a distinctive ping when empty. The impact this rifle had cannot be understated, the fielding of a semi-automatic against primarily bolt-action weapons giving the US a huge fire superiority advantage, and being one of the most iconic weapons of the era. With over 5 million produced during World War II alone, the rifle would remain in service during the Korean War and even finding some limited use in Vietnam, though it was replaced by the M14 as standard issue in 1957. Adopted in 1941, the M1 Carbine, chambered in the .30 Carbine cartridge, was a lighter and more maneuverable weapon intended to replace the M1 Garand, and was effective at up to 270 meters. It was much more effective for close combat, and 6 million were produced during World War II, though it would never actually replace the Garand in service, instead becoming popular with paratroopers, machine gun crews, and non-commissioned officers. The M1 would remain in service through Korea and Vietnam, along with its M2 and M3 variants, slowly but surely falling out of frontline use until being fully supplanted by the M16 and its variants. The spiritual successor to the M1 Garand, the M14 was a 7.62x51mm NATO chambered battle rifle intended to replace not only the Garand, but the M3 grease gun and M1918 bar to simplify logistics. It was praised for its reliability and accuracy, but the weapon was unwieldy in fully automatic fire and wasn't the most maneuverable weapon, its wooden construction deteriorating heavily in the jungle conditions of Vietnam it was sent to fight in. Effective at ranges of 450 meters, the M14 certainly wasn't lacking in power, but it was deemed too powerful to fill the M3 grease gun submachine gun role, and not powerful enough to fill the role of the M1918 bar along with being described as completely inferior to the M1 Garand. Soon, the M14 would be replaced by the M16 as standard issue, but the rifle still finds some limited use with the US Armed Forces to this day. Conceived as a replacement for the M14, the Eugene Stoner-designed M16 entered service with the US Armed Forces in 1964, the first weapon fielded by the US chambered in the intermediate 223 Remington cartridge. This gas-operated air-cooled rifle found its first combat tests in Vietnam, 
shipped off in 1965 with American soldiers, and despite being accurate at up to 550 meters, the original model developed an unfavorable reputation, many finding their rifle experiencing jams and stoppages in combat, leading to heavy casualties. This was down to two main issues. The powder burnt too fast and fouled the chamber, and the chamber was not chrome-lined, causing it to deteriorate fast, both issues being exacerbated by the false notion that the weapon was self-cleaning. By 1967, updates and improvements would be made to the rifle in the form of the M16A1, and original M16 models fell out of frontline service shortly after. The M16A1 was an updated variant of the original M16 to resolve a number of reliability issues experienced by soldiers in combat in Vietnam. With this update to the M16, different powder was introduced that produced less residue in the gun action. The barrel, chamber and bore were chrome-lined to improve sturdiness, cleaning kits were issued, better training programs were developed, and 30-round magazines introduced to replace 20-round ones. These changes dramatically improved not only the weapon, but also its reputation, and by 1968, faith was restored in the Stoner platform, the rifle becoming an icon of the Vietnam War. In response to requests by the US Marine Corps to update the M16 following the adoption of the 5.56x45mm cartridge as the new NATO standard, the M16A2 would be produced. The new cartridge was similar to the 223 Remington round, having nearly the same dimensions, but the NATO round had a higher pressure, and along with the new chambering, the A2 had a heavier barrel, new handguard, sturdier stock and pistol grip, improved rear sights, a case deflector for left-handed users, new muzzle compensator, and most importantly, a three-round burst over automatic fire to conserve ammunition. Adopted first by the Marines in 1983, the A2 would soon become standard issue for the US military, finding use in Grenada, Panama, and the Gulf War, the rifle serving through to this day, still being issued to non-combat troops. Adopted in 1994, the M4 is a carbine variant of the M16A2, differing in its shorter barrel, adjustable stock, detachable carrying handle, and Picatinny rails for scopes and other accessories. The M4A1 would be adopted alongside the M4, the A1 having a heavier and more durable barrel, along with a more consistent trigger pull and full automatic capability. These two carbine designs became the standard issue rifles of the US Armed Forces along with the M16A2 and later M16A4, serving through until today. Introduced in 1997, the M16A4 is mechanically the same as the M16A2, differing only with the addition of a removable carrying handle and Picatinny rails along the upper receiver and the barrel. With the global war on terror beginning in 2001, the M16A4 has had no shortage of combat operations, serving as the US standard issue rifle in Iraq and Afghanistan, the Stoner platform now being famed for its reliability rather than distrusted because of it. This served as the US's standard issue rifle until 2015, being largely replaced as standard by the aforementioned M4 and M4A1 carbines. Intended to replace the M249 as the squad automatic weapon, the M27 infantry automatic rifle is a 5.56x45mm NATO chambered rifle based on H&K's HK416. Effective at 550 meters, it's used exclusively by the Marine Corps, but it never fully replaced the M249, and the Marines instead looked to utilize the weapon to replace the M4, though this too has never fully materialized. Around 14,000 were purchased by the Marine Corps, it first seeing combat in Afghanistan in 2011, and has gained a mixed reputation among Marines, some liking the rifle, and others not so much. The most recent addition to the American arsenal, the SIG MCX Spear, soon to be the M7, is the newest service rifle of the US military. After defeating competition from the likes of FN and Beretta, the Spear was selected as the winner of the Next Generation Squad Weapon Competition in 2022, with this new rifle on its way to the hands of American soldiers. This weapon is intended to replace the M4 carbine, but it remains to be seen if the new rifle can or will fill the M4's role. Thank you so very much for watching these videos. Please like and subscribe and comment below what you'd like to see me cover next.